Right, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this uh, Wednesday Wednesday evening. We've got about an hour and a half or so uh, with each other. I think from memory, this took just over maybe about an hour and 15 last time. Um, but it really is, you know, based on the kind of conversations that we might want to have. Um, so please do feel free to kind of make this as, as interactive as, as possible, because if it's just me talking about some new rules updates, it'll be a little bit dry and uh, we will be finished earlier, which might be an upside. But please don't take that as an encouragement to stay quiet and please do uh, get involved. You can do that a couple of ways. One is if you've just got a burning question, stick it in the in the chat function. Um, but obviously, if you have a question about the, the rule that we're talking about in that moment in time, then please do come off mute and uh, talk about it. We've got some um, some familiar faces in here and we've got some top dogs. I can see Pam and Jan in here as well. So we've got some of the some top international referees as well. And actually, this whole evening, um, we're actually going to be joined by a bunch of international referees who are actually going to be taking us through the new rules. Um, I was fortunate enough to referee in Dubai in November, and I think actually it was the first championships with these rules that we've actually played. So it was it was always a moment to, to try and navigate um, and interpret these these new rules. So this is the bunch that's on on the screen that we're that we're refereeing, and I've actually got them to talk about their rule that, that they wanted to, to bring to you. And then we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. Um, Viv and Bob, you've already explained that uh, you are a co from a coach's point of view and from a referee's point of view, and you've put yourselves in separate rooms. Um, I don't know whether to applaud that or to send you to you know couples counseling, I'm not too sure, but either way, uh, I think ultimately a good referee needs to have an understanding of a game from a coach's point of view. And a, you know, a good coach really does need to have a handle on the rules. And, and this isn't a referees update. This is a rules update. So we will try and come, at, come from it from both perspectives as we go through the evening. So please do chip up, if, especially if it's a rule where you're thinking, oh, as a referee, that might be a pretty straightforward rule. But actually, as a coach, you might think, oh, that means I've now got to think about this, this and this. And I hadn't really thought of that before. So please do come from both perspectives, a coach's and a referee's point of view. One thing to call, call out, COVID adaptations and, the, and new rules. The, the rules that we're going to talk about tonight are the new rules, not things that you have seen around COVID adaptations or if you've been watching any of the championships um, at the end of last year where you may have seen um, a lot of COVID protocols being put in place. That's not what we're talking about tonight. We are talking about new rules that are going to continue in this uh, version 1.1 1, 1 .1 and going forward. It's not really talking about COVID adaptations. Uh, I mentioned um, use the chat feature um, to ask any burning questions and then but feel free to, to contribute if, we're, if you have a question about the particular rule that we're discussing at the time. Another thing to point out, and, and referees, you know, this is our bread and butter stuff, is rules versus interpretation. And, you know, over the years, um, the rules, first of all, the language, fortunately for us, of Boccia is English. You would think that is great. Um, but I think probably other than the very, very first version um, of the CP ISRA rules, they've all been written in English by someone who isn't English. Uh, and that's led to a certain level of uh, confusion or interpretation open to it. I could say this time uh, they've, they've mainly been written by a, a Canadian. I'm not going to say anything more than that. I'm just going to say, is that in? I don't. But a lot of the rules you might read in one light and maybe if you're a referee, you read it in one way. Maybe if you're a coach, you read it in another way. Maybe if you're Scottish, you might think of it in one way. Or if you're English, you might think of it another way based on your previous training. So we will talk a little bit around rules and interpretation, but it is worth saying, as I mentioned at the start, these rules just have come out and have just gone through their first competitions. Um, and so those interpretations will come out <laughs> over the coming 
over the coming years and there will be updates to the rules as they're put into practice and we expect to see version 1.2 which just irons out some of the kinks of this first version now we've actually had um some of the match play in place so we will update you as, as that goes but but basically they are as they are for the next four years so that's a little bit of the the kind of context that we're in for tonight now not in this order but these are the rules that we're actually going to be discussing we're going to look at equipment checks we're going to look at equidistant balls female players target box no protests jack ball delay uh, ramps and equipment and a few others as well that have been there long standing like drop balls for example but they've now tried to just tighten up um the the rules around drop ball so we'll cover some um kind of odds and ends as well towards the end of it but that's pretty much what the tone is going to be for tonight um i guess before i kind of jump straight in i hope Oh, please shout if that isn't if this is what you expected. I hope that's what you expected to come to tonight is what I'm trying to say. And um, if not, you know, this is your moment or forever hold your peace. OK, so. First up, we're going to talk about we're going to start nice and easy. We're going to start with the new dimensions of the target box. And I've got uh, Loreno, who's going to um, take us through it and then we'll discuss it afterwards. from Brazil and I'll talk about the new rules and the penalty box now had 35 centimeters before it had 25. A quick and easy one to get us started um, Lorena was a bit shy about doing it but I was really keen to get him. It's Lorena from Brazil um, and he was just showing that the um, the target box has now increased in size 30 to 35 centimeters from 25 um, and I think that's great I think that is I think it's really good we saw immediately the success rate increasing um, and the very first championships especially amongst um, BC ones and BC twos there was a really big um, increase in going from 25 to, to 35 centimeters so for you coaches in the room uh, then make sure that they if especially if you're fortunate enough to have court markings down permanently that they are now updated to 35 centimeters the rules are still the same you know if the ball lands on the uh, the markings then it is not inside the box it must be inside the box in order to be scoring and um, i think last time we did this towards the end because there wasn't much to talk about but i will open it up does anyone actually have any questions or how do you think this might actually affect you um, and especially at national and local play, uh, were you seeing much success at 25 centimetres? And do you think that extra 10 centimetres will make a difference at a more local level? As a coach, I mean, I've said to my players that, that <clears throat> yes, I think it will do, to be honest, Richard. Um, and when players have asked, you know, what's the rationale behind it? I sort of reference what you've just alluded to is is that the success rate must have been looked at and deemed to be you know pretty low considering you get the penalty box as a, almost as a reward for for somebody's breaking the rules if you like. So for me as a coach, yeah, it, it, I think it's a good thing. If you think about a penalty box and in, in a penalty shot in, in football, I'm guessing they must be at a 90% success rate, you would expect. Um, but yes, it was certainly in some classifications, it was certainly an awful lot lower than that in, in Botry. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Okay, yes, a nice easy one to get us started. Um, I should just say I have got at the top of each one the rule reference. I'm not. I haven't necessarily written out the rule all of the, the all of the rules um, verbatim. It's the shorter ones I have, or I've um, paraphrased them. But if you do want to follow along in the rule book, then you will see at the top of each uh, slide the the full rule reference. So, Richard, sorry. Yeah. Can I just ask Natalie a very very quick question while we're on that? Are Butcher England going to be producing the Perspex 
35, 35 boxes like they, we had when we were academies with the 25s. Um, I'm trying to think who made them for us. I feel like it was, was it Steve Ferber? I've got no idea, but it, they are very, very useful because all you've got to do is mark the, the centre and then put the box down and then you, you, it's, you know, it's... Yeah, I feel like someone kindly donated, so we, um, we need to be oh, tapping okay. them up, up again, but okay. yeah. Right. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to move on to um, equidistant balls and we've got david from hong kong who's going to take us through this it's a little bit of a long one but we will absolutely cover this um off the video as well from hong kong has been uh, referring for the international un for more than 20 years now i would like to um, talk about the uh, equidistant balls in the past when i check here no matter how many different color of balls on it, it was a uh, equidistant. So the last ball make this situation and she got to play it for the legs. If it makes no difference, then it was authentic to the other side to play until the equidistant was changed. Now the Liu Wu it depends on how many color of balls touch or equidistant with other color balls. For example, if uh, two red balls and only one blue ball touch on it, that means two red balls are against one uh, blue ball. In this time, uh, we can say that um, two red ball is leading this end. So blue ball is losing. So next turn should be the blue ball to play. This is the Liu Wu. All right, yes, we will go, we will just go through that uh, now. Obviously these guys are all speaking in their second language. So I really do appreciate the time that they, that they gave and what i'm going to set up here with my um camera angle i will take this off share screen so what we've got here is a little botcher court just in the um in the corner of my room and what we've what we're going to do is just run through it. so what we're talking about is the new rules for equidistant balls so we have our jack ball and in the past, if we ended up with a situation like this, uh, let's stick a blue one there. Oh, it's going to roll away. There we go. Then we've got equidistant balls and blue played the most recent ball. So they're going to play again. That stays exactly the same. That's normal. So imagine this second ball comes in and doesn't do anything there. Well, it alternates, as you know. So it's now red to play. And let's say now the score is 2-1. Now, they're all touching. And previously, you would continue to alternate. But this is the thing that's changed. What you would say is that reds are winning. Yes, they're touching their three equidistant balls. But they, the reds have got two and blues have got one. And so blue will continue to play until they're able to change the score. So that's the only difference really that's there. It's subtle and it doesn't happen very often, but it is a worthwhile change. And just to recap that once again, then I can um, open it up to, to any questions. If we have the normal situation where we've got one, one coming in, red played first, then it was blue. So it's gonna be blue to play again and they miss out. And then you're going to continue to alternate because it's still 1-1 one, one, and red come in. The next team to play is blue, not because they're alternating, but rather because red are winning 2-1. And vice versa would be this, the same. So if red missed and then it was still alternating and it was blue, then of course it would be red to play next, not because they're alternating, 
but because blue is winning two to one on equidistant balls. Does that make sense? Any questions around that? Um, Rich. Mm. So in in that scenario, say um, uh, red were scoring two and blue were scoring one. Blue then knock away one of the red balls, but there's still one of each ball touching. Would they just go back to alternating then? Yeah, so it, that would be classed as a, as a new situation. So whenever it's a new situation, um, then you would start that process again. So whoever threw the most recent ball to create that new situation would then throw the, the following ball and then yeah. it would alternate unless that point of, you know, two against two points to one uh, happened again. Okay, thanks. All right. I'm hoping that this isn't stunned silence rather than, oh yeah, totally got it. This is, this is obvious. Um, uh, but last uh, couple of seconds, if anyone has any further questions on this before we move on. There we go. Okay. Now this one might be a little bit more juicy, especially for you coaches in there. So just be thinking about how this impacts your players um, on the court. So we're going to hand over to uh, Helena Bastos. Uh, in her words, the oldest international referee in the world. Hello, I am Helena. I am an international referee from Boccia. I start in 1990, I think. Um, perhaps I'm the oldest referee in the world. <laughs> but um, Bocce has improved uh, very much and they changed some rules. One of them, the last changes, it was about protests. They disappear. And if we think about uh, uh, to avoid to spend time during the games and after the games, it's better not to have protests. That's why I like this change. And uh, I hope that we can make more changes that uh, are good for the players. Okay, protests, a little bit of a controversial one. This maybe affects more of the upper echelons of the sport rather than, you know, you, you know, Wakefield versus whoever um, it might be at more, more local level. But this is, this is important because before, um, if you remember on score sheets and things, you had two players that needed to sign the score sheet. They needed to agree the decisions of the mm -hmm. referee and need to agree the score. And by taking the protest out of it or that mechanism of protest, it is very much more like football of, you know, when the final whistle's blown, then that's it. Game, game over. Um, and it's now by taking the protests away, it, it has taken that uh, power, if you think, could think of it that way, away from the players and the coaches. The argument is exactly as Helena has kind of led out. Look, protests just created an awful lot of delay and often confusion. And the success rate of protests mm -hmm. is just incredibly low. Um, and that isn't because, you know, the referees are, a, are all in it together and we're a cabal and we look after each other. No, we take protests very seriously and we don't communicate as we shouldn't do. We don't talk about it. It's an independent panel that kind of comes together. But often what we found was that uh, even the paperwork that people had to do to submit the protest, I, I just thinking of the po protest panels that I led, I think I would easily say 50% of the protest panels which I led, they were almost thrown out immediately because the paperwork wasn't done correctly. And it just created all of this admin. So on, in theory, protests or losing protests, you know, takes away an avenue of a player to make sure that everything has been fair in a match. But the reality was, was that there were very few were unsuccessful. And of course, you still can have the head referee or you should still have the head referee being called over to make the decision or the final decision on court without any losing any time. So 
what do we think of this? Um, maybe let's start with a few um, referees. I wonder if um, Pam and Jan might want to uh, say something there who maybe have seen a bit more protests, uh, hopefully not because of their refereeing, but have maybe been involved in those panels um, a bit more and just talk a little bit around that kind of maybe the success rate of them and how wh whether it was an effective tool for a player in the first place. Um, I'll start if you like. Um, I have been involved in about three or four, I think, protest panels um, internationally. I've also led one now, or two actually, when I was in Australia. As you say, there's a lot of paperwork. And um, yeah, to make sure the paperwork is correct. One of the ones in particular I was involved that did do a lot of discussion because it was about an interpretation of the rule and how it had been interpreted in one competition into this one and things like that. All the protests I've been involved with were not upheld. So um, when you think of the time taken to do that and the reason for not upheld, I seem to remember another one was actually went further to the technical delegate. It was appealed and again did not um, was not upheld. So it is going to cut a lot of time um, you know, sort of because obviously that's got a knock on effect of matches being delayed and things like that. Um, but when I looked at what was being protested, you know, sort of, um, yes, you know, so for some of the ones, it's like it is clear cut, you know, so why were they actually putting in a protest? Even, you know, so there were one that, as I said, it wasn't an interpretation that a head referee had made, but. I think that was the one that went to the technical delegate as the technical delegate said that was the interpretation for this competition all right and we will make sure that you know sort of this interpretation is now going to be applied to other competitions so um yeah 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 i mean the thing that pam was talking about there is when it goes to the technical delegate it's yeah. actually called an appeal Appeal, and yeah. that's like the second level of that but you with an appeal what you're appealing against is not the decision it's the process that yes. is that has been gone through so the and it, it just meant it was even let you know the chances of an appeal going through would have would have been incredibly rare just thinking of you coaches in there what does this mean for your players because if you think about it beforehand with a protest you had 30 minutes after the completion of a match to get with your players to look at the rules, write something down and submit it. Um, what do you think now this is? Um, now you're not gonna get a chance to talk to your players. It's all on court. How do you think this is gonna affect your game and how it's gonna affect your coaching of the game as we kind of look to open up competitions throughout this 2022? Richard, hi. Um, personally, I've not been involved in, in protests to, to the level that this, this rule is probably referring to. But for me, particularly as, as you've already mentioned, it's more likely to be at the higher levels. Um, I mean, obviously I'm moving, moving into a higher level international uh, coaching sphere. For me, it gives the control to the athletes, but as a coach, I think it's important that you express this particular rule to the athletes and actually say to them, you know, you have to really, really think about this now rather than not necessarily making willy-nilly decisions, but from what Pam said and from what yourself has said, there have been protests in the old style, you know, that have spent, that have, that have held up a lot of matches, that have held up time, they've held up officials. So for me as a coach, as long as the athletes are aware that, that this is now the, the situation, um, and to instill into them, you know, you've really got to think about this. You know, you don't want to be bringing the head referee on just for the sake of it, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Jan put in the uh, in the message board um, that, that, you know, once the game's finished, the game's finished. And, and it's the same as football or rugby or any, any, any sport, you know, once that final whistle's gone... It's yeah, on, on that point, you know, we still almost out of etiquette have been uh, showing the players the score at the end and, you know, checking that they agree. But the reality is, is that that is just an etiquette, because if they disagree with it, 
there is you know there is nothing that they can do the, the match has it that match has finished just so i know we've got a few players that are maybe on here or certainly maybe ex players uh, i wonder if there's any players how do you think what do you think this how do you feel about the responsibility of basically having to know all of the rules because ultimately you're going to have to argue against a referee as well as concentrate on your game how, how do you think that will that will work or not work as the case may be just muted i've never really come across having to have a protest and again at this level so i don't really know how it would pan out but i would think it certainly save a lot of time because what I've seen and heard from other matches, then it does be very time-consuming. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I I think, and I, I know this isn't who the rule is targeted to, but I think maybe for newer players or newer players to the international scene, who would be moving into a place where these types of protests would be um, shown. I think to put that, it just makes sure that everyone knows the rules inside and out. And as, as everyone said, right, Certainly when I've played in matches, when I think someone someone's done something wrong, I want to bring it up there and then. I don't want to wait till the end of the match then. So I, I, I think it's what the players, or certainly the players that I know have wanted, they want to, when they see something wrong, they want to bring it up there and then yeah, and not have to wait 30, 40 minutes after a match. Because yeah. at the end of the day, if they think they won and then it turns out they've lost, but they've, had, they've been delayed their match by an hour, two hours, three hours maybe, waiting for this process. Yeah, thank you for that. I think, it, I mean, it's worth saying that, that I guess the beginning part of this is the same. So in the old rules and in these new rules, you raise it at the time. You have to. That's the same as the as the old one. And you get the head referee involved like, or assistant head referee. And um, that's the same as the as the old rules. But at that point, it then stops. So the bit that you're saying there about you'd want to raise it at the time, yeah, that that is hopefully the same as it was was before. And I have to say, and um, that I think that the we are uh, blessed in England with a, a level of refereeing and the number of referees that just isn't the same, or that strength and depth isn't quite the same in in other countries. And it's not to say that we're perfect because we're absolutely not uh, i can't even remember how long i've been an international referee but yet in dubai i'm still learning i'm still progressing my skills um and you know that that goes without saying but i think in a lot of other countries they don't have the strength and depth that we have in england scotland and wales and so and i should say northern ireland shouldn't i uh, as this is a uk course not a gb course and um, so we 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 are do have that benefit and i think we have reaped the benefits of that over the years but it was maybe it maybe has meant that we haven't experienced protests in the same way as other um countries may well have okay involved. sorry rich I oh hi matt hi. talking of hi. talking of wales yes thought i'd chip in being you mentioned me um i was involved with one I, I was lining a game internationally i was involved with um a big dispute on court that eventually that was going to go to protest and essentially didn't because both sides messed up and it got very it got very complicated but head ref came on all sorts of things and if and there was a lot of discussion it was probably 15 minutes of discussion on court and if that had been then had gone to appeal as well i mean that would have taken forever and it was that quarterfinal level at internationals and that would have been really complicated so i think overall you know that did get resolved on court rightly or wrongly and it's probably the best decision overall 
Yeah, 15 minutes is a long time to chat on court, but if you think the minimum time for a protest to come in after a game was 30 minutes, yep. and then you have to convene a panel, you, the, the minimum time for a protest is you know 60 minutes, and I don't think I can remember a protest that li- that only took 60 minutes. There's always something extra to do. So, um, and obviously the match has already been extended because there was already already an initial conversation. Okay, Bob. Just one question on this. The the, the second paragraph um, here says no further protests can be made. So if a if team A if the if the red team have made a protest during a match, that's it. Yeah, and I don't even call it protests uh, if they have um, you know as it says in there made a request of a ruling from the HR. So don't even like the, the whole term protest, right. you could just forget, like they've requested the head referee to, to come up with a final final ruling. Um, yeah. And that's it during the game. They only get that one. All right. OK, that's interesting. That needs to be instilled into the players. Yeah. OK, thanks, Richard. Do we, just to check that, you don't mean, we don't mean you can only query a situation once you can query multiple situations can't you Richard yes ab- absolutely yes yeah. yeah um there's a question in the chat from Craig as well um what would a person who struggles to remember or communicate do in this situation I'm guessing yeah. you mean from a player point of view there yeah I mean from a communication point of view um yes it- people will often come on with a very a much more limited vocabulary than if they were in the real world where they've got access to you know many communication devices um i guess the way that i would interpret that is that um is that you could request a translator in in that situation to add to your communication but of course they're not there to coach uh, they are only there to uh, to translate on on your behalf or to communicate on on your behalf with regards to um, you know maybe a learning disability or a, a memory impairment, it, that is just the case. Uh, coaches can't get involved, even if they're at the, sat at the end of court. This has got to be from the player. And in fairness, that was always the rule, especially on court. It was always down to the players. The coaches couldn't get involved during a game anyway. So that bit hasn't hasn't changed. I think it's also worth saying that in the UK, we have more classifications than we do internationally, where we take on different people with different types of disabilities that these rules maybe weren't written for. So we have BC8, for example, for uh, intellectual impairments, whereas that it doesn't happen internationally. So we do have some slight considerations um, in the UK that we maybe don't have as, as world watcher. I don't want to get too hung up on this one because oh. it does happen so rarely, but I feel there's one more question that wanted to come in or comment yeah. wanted to come in. It's Jackie. We have two non-verbal players who both use speech, like the liberator boxes, yeah. which on court they can't use because they're ramp players as well. How would they communicate? Well, if they're on, you know, they will have... Uh, so they leave their communicators off court, is that what you're saying? Yeah, because of the ramps, they can't use them because yeah. it's a fixed bar across the front of them. Yeah. So in that situation, you do at least you would have your ramp assistant who will have a, a level of communication and understand the situation better. And basically it's down to the referee to manage that conversation to make sure that they're understanding the player and that things aren't being embellished by, by the, um, the sports assistant. So be the sports assistant could put their hand up for them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank and you. And then that would be down to the referee to then navigate yeah. that and to make sure that it's fair. Because remember, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but ultimately the referee is there to ensure that, like, the players play to their best. Like, that's ultimately what, what we're there to do. We want a smooth game that allows players to play to the best in a fair and equal way. Um, we don't want to penalise someone because someone's non-verbal and their opponent isn't. We're going to try and make sure that we come to the right decision for the right reason. Um, yeah. Thank okay. you. All right. So now we're going to uh, move to Orna from Israel. And this is around um, the jack ball delay, which is uh, a new rule coming in. Hi, I'm Orna. 
I'm an international referee from Israel. Uh, I've been uh, international for six years. Um, I want to talk about the new rule which says that when the jack is played and then there's a problem with the score, with the time, then the player can uh, ask for the jack back to throw it again and then you reset the time. In this competition now in Dubai, it happened twice, two different uh, situations. One situation, when he threw the jack, uh, the time wasn't running, so the referee, without the player asking, just gave the jack back to the player and he threw the jack again. And then another situation, he threw the jack, the time was going, and then there was a problem on the score. So we went and dealt with, we went and dealt with the situation, and then the player could have asked for the jack back, he didn't. So then we just said the color and he threw a colored ball. So this is two different situations for the same new rule. Okay, thank you, Orna. She was very keen to to, uh, to tell, talk about this one because no one had ever come across this one in practice. And then she got it twice out of all of it. I think it only happened twice in the whole tournament. She got it. She got it both times. So she was very keen to, to bring this one to us. Yes, Jack Ball delay rule 10.4.1. Basically, if there's a lengthy delay between throwing your jack ball and the first coloured ball, the athlete may ask to propel the jack again uh, before propelling the first coloured ball. Time will be reset. Basically, we signal, we show the paddle, and normally it's going to be the time clock malfunction. I think that example, where it says example, is actually in, in the rules. I don't think I made that up because that is probably the most common reason why um, why there's a, there's a delay. So someone plays the jack, then we realize, oh, the clock's broken or you know, the time has put the wrong time on or something like that. Now, let's split this rule in half. First of all, what is a lengthy delay? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Is to, What is a, a lengthy delay? The way that I would interpret this and again this comes back to interpretation we've got a rule but we need to interpret what lengthy delay is is sometimes there is a um a malfunction with the clock and you as a referee you're stood in hopefully the correct position and you can turn and you know you can see that the time is on it they're fixing it it's rectified you don't have to move you don't really have to communicate with them you can just you just hold it there for a second or two they get themselves sorted and away they go I wouldn't call that a lengthy delay. I would generally call a lengthy delay where you're having to leave your position um, and go up to the to the timekeeper to talk to them about it. Now, whether that's 10 seconds, 20 seconds or one minute, um, that's where it's really difficult to tell. But generally, as a rule of thumb, if you're having to move or leave your position in order to sort this out, I would start to call that uh, a lengthy delay, but that is an interpretation of what this rule is. And the second element is the athlete, uh, the athlete may ask to propel the jack again. So the onus is on the athlete, not the referee. So as Orna said with the on the second match, if the ref if the player doesn't ask for it, then you're going to go back, you're going to show your paddle, and away you go because hey, we don't want to delay the games any longer. If they've not asked for it back, they might be very happy with where it landed and they might not care about it. Think of it, you know, BC3 match is just not important. So it's not an automatic thing. The athlete must request. And then it is uh, up to the referee's discretion, but, you know, because it says may ask to propel it again. We don't have to grant it, but we will do if we, have, if we feel that it is a lengthy delay. Time will be reset. Um, but remember, this is only for the jack ball. If you've thrown the jack ball and the red ball and you're onto, you know, ball number two or three or whatever, and then there's a lengthy delay, we don't get to restart the end. This is just for the jack ball. So what do we think? Is this a useful thing? Again, maybe thinking of players and coaches might be on the call. Is this a useful new rule? Um, or is it one of those things that's kind of such an edge case that it's not actually going to, we're not going to see that um, in in the UK matches. I like it because sometimes that might happen and the player might say, can I do that again? Because it's taken, taken so long. And in the past, the answer to that would have been no and sort of starts the end off in a negative way. This 
this just allows them to reset if they want to and, and go again and nobody's nobody's affected i think it's probably a good idea long term yeah um I, I I think to come off that uh, as a player, and I just joined the chat ball, and there'd been a lengthy delay. I'm probably just more likely to want to get the end going again from where I've set my chat ball. I I don't I can't see in my mind a time when I might want the jack to be given back to me, if that makes sense. Like, may, maybe if the jack was in such a position that it had to be moved, but I, I don't see that happening at all. Yeah, yeah I think as well, it, it might depend on, on your disability. So, uh, you know, a disability that might rely and maybe a bit more on muscle memory um, so maybe a muscular atrophy or or Duchenne's, they may, you know, where they want to throw the jack, they want to keep that pendulum swing going um, and just, you know, they're going to throw the two balls pretty quickly after each other. Whereas, like I say, if you're a BC3, probably doesn't matter that much because, you know, the ramp is in position and away, away you go. So I think that's why it's an option. I think I what's think... interesting, go on, sorry, who was that? It was me, Vivian. Um, I think also um, I've noticed in the past this business about the time clock malfunction is often because the timers are not very competent. They're new to being new as timers. And we're all human. We make mistakes when we're doing something new. And it's often a timer error that's caused the malfunction. I've had that at several um, matches and it's often the athletes that will put our hand up and say, their clock's still going and now clock's not going and vice yeah. versa. And you have to deal with that situation. So I yeah. think that it's, uh, we already do this. Yeah, I, I think to you're right. To a certain point. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that, um as a referee, you know, you show the paddle and then you turn back to the players because you want to kind of keep your eyes on the players. And there is a, a school of thought as referees that you, you know, you should show the paddle to the players and not make, even make eye contact with the timer. You should just show them the paddle because you don't want to lose, you don't want to lose con you know, eye contact with the, with the players. I generally think, as you have said, especially early in competitions, there is a, a higher risk of the uh, the timer going wrong, then there being a violation in that you know 0.5 of a second where you look to just see you know, make eye contact with the timer. Um, but yeah, that that certainly could be the case. I think with all of these, with the jack ball delay, with the protest thing, I think what this really does is put the onus on truly knowing the rules onto the player and. I think as coaches, that's something to really, really consider is how well do our players actually know the rules because they might know them a bit and that's great. They might know how to play them. But all of this, in order to take advantage of this, it has to be the athlete to ask. The protests have to be done or the lack of protest because of the lack of protest. Any conversation around the rules or how a game's been refereed has to be done by the player at the time. So I think my overall, we've got a few more rules to go, but I think my overall feeling about these changes is that, yes, it quickens the game up, but it does put a much heavier onus on the players really having a good knowledge um, of the rules in order to kind of be in the best position possible uh, during match play. Okay, let's move on. We're going to move on to Ronnie. Now, Ronnie's actually got a, a couple um, and again, so it's a little bit of a long one, but we will break it down and make sure that, we're, that we've got it covered. He's got a couple of rule, rules that he wants to bring to you. Okay, hello there. I'm Ronnie from Belgium, international referee since six years. I want to talk to you about uh, the ramps. A uh, few new things uh, over there. First of all, during equipment check, be aware of the raised top uh, of uh, the, the ramp. 
uh, pay attention to that. And during the game, something new is the get out of the way uh, movement. And players move forwards and backwards during the game, but also the equipment has to be out of the way for the uh, opponent players. In normal circumstances, the uh, opponent uh, uh, assistants will move the ramp a bit uh, backwards. Uh, if is this is not the case, uh, it's forbidden that uh, a, play a player's assistant touches the ramp of the opponent player. You just have to ask at the player and the assistant to move uh, the ramp so they have uh, the space. Also during the equipment check, uh, it's not allowed anymore that the uh, referees who does the check, they, they don't touch the ramp anymore. That assistants will put the ramp inside uh, the box and outside of the box. That's quite something new. Okay, so a few little rules and a little bit of wind noise. I apologize for that. Hopefully you managed to, uh, to follow that. Um, we'll kind of do it in, in a different order to how he um, how Ronnie brought that to us. We're going to start with the um, out of the way rule rather than the get out of the way rule, which I think is, again, uh, a Dutch interpretation. Get out of the way rule. No, it's just the out of the way rule. And I think this again comes a little bit down to our etiquette in the UK. You know, generally speaking, we move back and forwards when we're playing. And, you know, it's just, I would say a gentleman, but a gentle lady, a lady's uh, agreement, a gentleman's agreement in order to do that. It's not quite like that on the continent. And it's not quite like that elsewhere in, in the world. And so where we have this etiquette of moving back and forwards, what we now have is a rule that the out of the way rule where people must move back. They must move back and they must move their equipment as well. So for BC threes, you know, that's after every shot that they're, you know, where their opponent is then playing, they need to move and they need to move their equipment. They must get out of the way to allow their opponents free access to the playing area. And it must be done quickly. You know, severe consequence, yellow card, if that doesn't happen now, Again, just to go back to our role as, as a referee, our role as a referee is not to catch players out. So it's not a case of we show the paddle and then we're just suddenly expecting the opposition to sprint backwards and get out the way in like a split second. You know, it might take a little moment or two in order to, to move back. We're not trying to catch them out. And they may well, and I saw this on numerous occasions, especially with the ramps, um, or a uh, BC2 who had the players had the balls left on the floor rather than in, in a ball holder where they would move back and then they would realize that their balls had been left at the front of the box and then they had to come forward. As a referee, we're not reaching for the yellow card, you know, in that situation. Obviously, if that happens for a second time and maybe a third time and you've already told them, you know, don't forget to move your botcher balls back with you then maybe they're not doing it uh, accidentally. Maybe they're trying to gain an advantage and that's where you would start thinking about a yellow card. But it's certainly not the case of, you know, oh, they left the, they left the botcher balls, yellow card straight away. We're not there to catch players out. So players and coaches that are on here, it's certainly the message we'll be um, teaching and preaching in the UK is that we're not trying to catch people out with this new rule. Um, but of course, it is something that must be done um, and must be done on, on every shot. Any comments or any thoughts before we move on to the second half of his? Um, Jackie again. With our two ramp players, neither of them can move their own chairs. So obviously it's going to, so the time will be allowed for them to, the sports assistant to move the chair and then to come back and move the equipment. Yep. Yep. Again, it, it's, you know, a little bit like we talked about lengthy delay on the previous, on the previous rule. Uh, this is out of the way, must be done quickly. That doesn't say in you know, the first 10 seconds or anything like that. Now, um, we have a, a lot of players who, uh, certainly in Dubai, um, a lot of players from Hong Kong and Singapore, they're all, they're all in, in manual chairs there. Uh, because it's just easier. They're often are a bit more compact. It means you can get better angles in the box. Um, and when you get the hang of it, when you've practiced it ahead of time, then you can move back pretty quickly. And um, I have to say there's a, there's a ramp assistant for uh, the BC3 uh, Singapore female player 
um if you look back on the dubai live streams who's absolutely excellent you can she puts the things in exactly the same place every single time they've really really worked out a really great routine for minimizing fuss knowing where everything is and of course really the important thing is for when it is your turn you want to get back in position as quickly as possible don't you so it's not just about limiting it you know limiting the impact for the other player it's when you come back onto court and so if you really practice those routines you know exactly when you move back this is how you move back this is where the ramp will be it means that when you come back to play your shot you know exactly where that is that muscle memory is there you're able to get back into position really quickly and certainly through the competition we saw the time that people took to move back and forwards just really reducing to something which where it wasn't a big impact on play um from a time perspective but it certainly helped um make sure that there wasn't and you know the players had you know, the full access to the court to be able to play anywhere that they wanted without having to worry about you know someone else's equipment or someone else staring them down or whatever it might be because they sat very close to them so it definitely helped um match play etiquette absolutely a couple of bits in the chat richard um any suggestions jan asks about how we'll handle this for non-wheelchair athletes who can't stand or move quickly and safely yeah it's, that's a really good question um my uh, the honest answer is no we haven't we haven't thought about that i i think the reality is is that um this is probably primarily focused well it is primarily fo it is focused on bc one to fours or bc one to fives which are wheelchair users so i i would imagine and i'm might be speaking out of turn so nothing tell me to shut up or rachel crack can send me a, a message later but i would imagine that you know again we're not there to catch players out and so we would make sure that whatever rules that we came up with for the competition would make sure that um, that it was done in the fairest possible way. We're not there to catch people out or penalise them, whether they're in a wheelchair or they're not, whether they're in a, you know, they can propel manually or whether they have to be um, supported in, in any movement in the box. Terry, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I think probably Jen was um, bringing up the situations that we uncovered when we ran our back to Butcher Southeast. Um, certainly I have one player in in the Thanet Club here who uses crutches to, to move around, flatly refuses a wheelchair while he's still able to, uh, mm -hmm. to get around on his own legs. That means once he's sitting, it's very, very difficult for him to get up again. Um, he may require assistance in doing so, um, or he may take upwards of a minute to, to 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 get his crutches under him and and shift so we had to make provision for him to turn aside um and get out of the way as well as he was able to do so re remaining on the spot yeah, yeah difficult and i think in those situations definitely you know that's where the head referee of the competition itself will come up with something i think um a couple of things spring to mind straight away one is as the rules change and this is the case with any rule how we play the game has to change now for us it's often around you know the knowledge of the game or how how a rule is implemented but for for this athlete it may well just be physically how do i play the game has to change now otherwise i'm just penalizing myself I completely understand, you know, wanting to walk around and stay on crutches for as, as long as possible. But at the point where it's impacting performance, then he's got a, a choice to make really at that point. I think the second thing could do is, you know, often we talk about you know, getting up as close as you can to the, the throwing line. So you're as close as you can to the jack ball. What he may want to do is actually his default position might be halfway uh in the box or towards the back of the box might actually be his throwing position so he doesn't have to move back and forwards because actually his his throwing position is at the back of the box already and so it really only relies on the opponent moving back and forwards but of course what that means is they're having he's having to throw you know potentially a meter and a half or two meters further than um than their opponent so a couple of things to consider then but as ever as new rules come in we all have to adapt our game in his case, it might just be more of a physical adaptation than for someone else. But um, I think ultimately, 
as Watcher England and as um, the other home nations go through these rules and see the reality of it being played out in classifications for which these rules weren't written, um, then I think that we will you know, come to something that is fair and um, easily replicable across the countries. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with that. I mean, I brought the, this chap up as, as an example, but he is only an example. Um, I mean, many BC6, for instance, will be, we have fairly elderly ladies who play. Um, yeah, um, they, they don't use a wheelchair at all. They've got no intention of ever using a wheelchair. Um, but they are very ponderous and movement and getting up out of chairs is slow on account of perhaps arthritis or what, whatever. But uh, yeah, I think, um, as you say, the rules were not necessarily made for BC6. And, uh... hey, well, I tell you what, session two, they, you know, I link lifting the game from session one, aren't they? Because we weren't, we didn't have this level of discussion. Thanks, Terry. I think that's really, that's really useful. Thank you. I was just going to add as well, without getting too hung up on the differences between the COVID adaptations. Obviously, we what we are seeing this in a different format at the minute, linked to the COVID adaptations and people moving completely out of their box. So uh, there is that sense of that little bit extra request for movement at the current time. Um, to, to bear in mind which is slightly different to this um and there's just an, a note in the chat richard from from vivian as well about the timing that the ref shows the paddle to the the timekeeper to allow for that little bit of time for movement what's your thoughts on that yeah we we don't we haven't been accounting for it like it would just be so hard in order to um to bring that in we we referee it in the same way as we were refereeing before and one last one hopefully uh from craig can players mark the floor to help them remember and speed is that back to their positioning i guess i mean i guess so there's there's nothing to say that you can't bring something into the court. I would imagine when you talk about marking the court, uh, it might be to put some sticky tape down, not a getting your Sharpie out um, or anything like that. So I think in general, whilst we're trying to reduce the number of things that people bring into the court, it is ultimately up to the players, what they, they bring in. And so if people wanted to do that, but I think also that's where coaching comes in and that's where practice and routine comes in. Cause the idea is by the time that you get to match play, you shouldn't, it should be second nature. It shouldn't be, Oh, I need that marker. I don't have the marker. I don't know what to do because you're not doing it for the competition. You should have been doing it in training this whole time. Um, otherwise by the time you come to match play time, you're introducing something new, which you've not done before. Um, and you won't, you don't really want to do that on, on match day. OK, so that was the first half of Ronnie's question or and the second one was around ramps. And this, again, hopefully be a little bit quicker. Um, but he mentioned on there um, uh, around raised tops. Now, we don't have too many of these in in the UK, but in case you didn't know what it is, this is a raised top. And it was basically came around from one very successful manufacturer of, of botch ramps and they had this design and it was. Uh, the interpretation of, of the raised top was that it could be used as a sight or a scope. And of course, I'm sure you're aware that you, you can't use sights and scopes um, on a botcher ramp. And so that's why it has been um, taken out. So that extra piece at the top, which you see there, um, can't happen. And in fact, any uh, protrusions must not exceed the height of the diameter of, of the ball. So any side rails or anything like that, they've got to be, they can't be higher than a ball. I remember, oh, this was some time ago now, is in Lisbon. And the US team, the USA team, it was one of their first world championships. They were pretty, well, they've been around for a long time, but they kind of been off the scene a little while. And um, this, uh, this guy came with a, a, a jet black ramp that was fully enclosed so you kind of had the ball at the top and then it came out at the bottom. And you didn't get to see the ball all the way down. And it, it just actually made it really difficult to referee because you can't kind of track the ball. 
there's other rules around ramps that you can't have things that make the wall go faster or slow, which of course were checked beforehand. But that's one of the things, all ramps must be open top as it were, and the side rails can't be higher than the, than the ball itself um, as it goes down. So hopefully that's a little bit easier to understand than the, than the or have less discussion than the other one. And the final thing that he mentioned, which I haven't put the rule on there, was just an equipment check, because uh, this is more procedural. As I'm sure that you will know that in equipment check, we have to check the size of the ramp. And um, now this is uh, by laying the ramp on the side, on its side, inside a playing box. Now that's entirely done by the coaches um, and it's just observed by the referees. We don't get hands on at all with the with the equipment. They need to prove to us that it fits in rather than us making it fit in. A very subtle difference, but it was worth just mentioning um, because Ronnie brought it up as well. So that's ramps. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. We're now we're going to move on to a couple of rules which um aren't rules that we're going to see certainly at Botcher England competitions anytime soon but I wanted to put them in firstly because the two referees wanted to discuss them because they wanted to bring them to to our attention but also there has been a bit more chatter about in the refereeing world and in the Botcher community so we are going to talk a little bit more about equipment checks themselves and then about uh, female players and individual games so just to be clear, we're not looking to implement these things um, as far as I'm aware this in this next year, but I think it would still be useful just to, to go through and to show you um, around uh, equipment checks. So I've got uh, David from Portugal is going to take us through this one. Hello, I'm David. I'm from Portugal. I'm very free uh, by 11 years, international by six. Uh, I'll talk about the new rule. Uh, about the, the evaluation of the walls on the, the call room. Uh, I think it's a, a, a good rule because in that way uh, we can evaluate all the walls uh, that will come uh, in court at the hour. Uh, players cannot uh, bring too much balls and we don't spend too much money uh, evaluating many balls. This way, only the balls that uh, make that uh, players uh, came to the call room are evaluated, and then we will see what what uh, happened. Um, I think it's a good a good measure. So this is a, a time saving um, exercise, really. So at big competitions, international competitions. Um, and as well as national championships, uh, certainly in England, we have done equipment check where people bring their equipment beforehand and all of the botcher balls get checked um, normally on four different checks. They have a roll test, um, a size test, a weight test and an inspection just to make sure that they, you know, the stitching's good and that they're, uh, they're in a, a good condition. Um, and what used to happen was, a, well, there was no limit on how many sets of balls a player could bring um, and I know because I wrote it down that the record that we had was uh, 64. One player brought 64 balls, he brought five sets um, of balls, not all of them were fully intact and he just wanted to have everything that was there and you can imagine you know four checks times 64 balls you know times I don't know 10 players in a team in a country times 15 countries like it just we were just thousands and thousands of botcher balls were being checked before the matches had even started and it just it became a little bit out, out of control and this is what this has brought in to make sure that we don't do any of that before a competition after the coin toss is done in the call room the referee will check the botcher balls of the play of the balls that are about to be played uh, and if any of them fail then it'll be a yellow card Sounds sensible and um, good, and it is, and David really liked it, and it's fair to say that lots of people do really like it. But the reality is that what ends up happening is you need three international referees in order to check the balls, and you end up with this queue of people because every single player 
So let's say who have we got there? We've got Japan in the background. Let's say this is the semi-finals, uh, and they're going to have their balls checked. Then we're going to go straight to the final, and they're going to have the exact same balls checked again. And that's fine when it comes to knockout stages, but when you're talking, you know, teams and pairs uh, and matches where you've got lots and lots of different balls that are there, it really does take a long time. The whole of the time, obviously, we've got a few extra COVID protocols where we have to then sanitize between each set. Um, but actually, what it means is the 15 minutes in a call room and thinking very much of a referee's perspective here was already pretty intense. You've got to say, hello, what's nice to meet you. Can I check your name? Can I make sure I've got the right players? Um, you know, do the coin toss, check the ramps, all of that kind of stuff. And that normally takes 15 minutes because often the head referee, people like me, well, actually doesn't want you to have 15 minutes. They give you 10 minutes because we want to get out early. So we stay on track. Um, and now you have to check all of these balls as well. And it takes a long time. This is one match that we're doing here. And we've got three international referees. And so because there's three international referees, I will stay there and do my court, Lorena's court and Orna's court, because, of course, you know, we want to help each other out. And that does just mean that is extra time away from our court, extra time cut from the, um, the call room and our procedures. So as a referee, and I think we are in the UK, we are pretty hot on our um, like procedures and call room stuff. But we have to be really hot in order to make sure that, we, that we're uh, completing this in, in time. Now, we had the luxury in Dubai of one match off, uh, one match on, one match off. And so the head referee said, don't just come five minutes before your game, come 10 minutes before your game. But of course, we all know domestically, we don't live the life of luxury of one game on, one game off. We're often doing two games on, one game off, or three games on and one game off. And so that time between matches is really, really super tight. And I think that's part of the reason that we're looking to, to just take our time in rolling out these, these rules um, in England. But I wanted to share, share it with you. I wanted to open the discussion because this is happening internationally and I know there's been a lot of chatter about it. So there you go. David's talked at length about it. I've talked at length about it. Have you guys got any, any comments? Nothing left to say. Well, that's good. We'll move on then. Um, the next one um, is our very own Lauren. He's going to take us through a uh, rule. Hello, I'm Lauren. I've been an international referee for a year and a bit. Um, I'm going to talk about the new female rule. Um, in Boccia. So before it was a completely mixed gender sport um, and now we have individual uh, competitions for male and female in BC 1, 2, 3 and 4. Um, and then in the team and pairs it's now still a mixed gender event but there are no substitutes so there must be both a male and a female on court for all ends um, in both the team and pair competitions. So there we go. We had our first female individual champion uh, in Dubai um, it was a momentous occasion if anyone follows uh, Lauren on social media I think she uh, live streamed the, the, you know, the end of that of that match because it was such a momentous occasion um, so in international levels female uh, there are female divisions for for individual matches there's no substitutes anymore in teams and pairs and so a female must be on court at all times um, so it just tightens up some of those rules uh, around female players. One thing just to add to this is individual coaches. So if you're an individual player, you can now have a coach with you on court. So I just wanted to mention this here as we're talking about individuals. I know Lauren didn't talk about it there, but it's worth saying that now if you're a BC, one, two, three, four, or I guess all the way up to eight, um, and male, female, you can uh, bring your coach onto court with you. Now they sit at the end of court near the, near the timer. And of course, they're not there to do protests and those kind of things for you. But it does mean that in the one minute between ends, for the first time, uh, individuals can legally receive coaching advice uh, because I think people still receive coaching advice, but it's probably a little bit on the illegal side before. So now 
if you have your coach on court with you, um, you can receive coaching uh, advice. As a referee, what that means is uh, BC2s and BC4s, you don't have to pick up the balls any longer. Uh, as a referee, you actually get that full minute because they'll have their coach to come and um, to pick up the balls for them. So there we go. Female players, no substitutes and individual coaches. Silence again. So we are coming on now onto the last two rules, and these weren't talked about by our um, esteemed colleagues uh, in the on the international circuit. These were just a few that that were missed. I just wanted to cover, and I think actually, probably this rule may have more impact for us uh, on this call than probably any of the others because it's around uh, drop botchables, and you know, this happens much more at a you know at a beginner stage than it does uh, at an elite level but the interpretation around uh, drop botchables has changed and i just wanted to to share this share this with you so before oh i won't talk about before i'll talk about what it is now if a ball lands in the playing area so past the throwing line regardless of whether that's been accidentally thrown or is an accidental release if it goes into the playing area it is considered to be a ball in play so regardless of how it got there it is considered to be a ball in play if it crosses the throwing line and lands in the playing area now if the ball for whatever reason stays behind the throwing line and even in the opponent's box then it's considered to be a dropped ball and could be replayed so I just want to be really clear on that, that if for whatever reason, uh, even if a player believes they've dropped it, so that maybe they did drop it, they dropped it on the lap and it rolled off the lap and goes into play, it is considered in play, not considered drop. There's no limit to the number of times a player could drop a ball. That's the same as before. Um, and time doesn't get, uh, doesn't get adjusted in order to, um, to adjust for any dropped balls. So this is just something to really think about. Again, for your beginner players, it might be what you might want to do from a coaching perspective is set your player not right up against the throwing line. You might want to set them 30 centimetres back from there, just as they're really getting to understand their grip, you know, how they grip the ball, and they're able to be much more consistent in their release. Because if they're inconsistent in the release, the chances are that ball will finish in the box and they'll get it back again. Whereas if it crosses that throwing line, then it would be considered in play. Any thoughts, coaches? If, um, is it the athlete that uh, asks for the ball to be um, given back to re be replayed, or would it be the ref who automatically goes and gives the ball back to the Yeah, I mean, I, to player? I, I think the onus is on, on the player. As a referee, I wouldn't want to... Um, I wouldn't want to try and guess whether that's been played or dropped because it may be for some tactical reason that they want a ball, which you might think, well, that's, that's miles off the head. But actually what it might be is in the line of the opponent. And the closer a player puts the ball, you know, to the opponent in line with the opponent, the harder it is to get around, especially if you're talking wheelchairs and uh, power chairs and, and ramps and things because of course that ball looms large um so i i wouldn't want to try and guess i generally leave it to the player again as a referee you kind of know because they look at you with that alarm distressed look on their face like you even if they're non-verbal you know whether they've dropped it whether they meant to meant to throw it pretty pretty quickly so it's not a hard and fast rule that if it's dropped inside a box you return it and if it's goes over the box line it's played it says may be replayed i mean okay. uh, i think if it's dropped yes you give give the ball and it stays in the box you give the ball back because yeah that's i think it's no use to anyone and of course it might actually be dropped in the opponent's box and if you didn't have this rule in place uh where you gave it back 
then people might drop it literally in the opponent's box <laughs> so and leave it there because no i don't want it back <laughs> you know um so i would say yes the you would you'd be obligated uh, uh, i think i think the the language says may be replayed and um, but i think if it hasn't crossed a throwing line i think and just so, generally just give it so back. richard just a sort of thing what happens if if an athlete goes to play a ball but drops it behind him and it goes out of the box behind him. Yeah. What well, happens I mean, then? That's a, a good question. And I guess is much more likely to happen locally. Um, my interpretation, again, Pam, please feel free to, to chirp up on this, is ultimately it's now gone out of play. So it's not in the player's box. And it hasn't crossed the thrower's line. Um, but it's now not on the field of play. It's now not on, on the court. So mm, thinking of that very quickly, I, my initial reaction would be that it would be a dead ball. But Pam, please feel free to tell me that I'm utterly wrong and I've completely got that. You know, that the wrong that is an interesting one because it, it is, um, it's behind the throwing line. But yes, it's out of court. So dead ball, but then it is a drop ball. I think that's something because this is a, a rule for, you know, um, well, UK botcher. I think something in maybe we could um, it should be decided about what 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 is accepted in that situation. I think it, you know, rather and, and then it can be applied to all rules, uh, all competitions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. what <clears throat> I'm going on about is the fact that if the player has dropped the ball, although it's he dropped it in the box, the momentum has taken it out of the box. Yeah, I, I think coming down to uh, a couple of the things we're talking about. Just looking at the rule now, I've got the rule book up on my on my second screen, and the um, if you look at ten point one four from the rule book, you don't have to pull it up now. But you'll see that half of it has been reworded, uh, and you know that because it's in blue. Um, uh, it's either been re. I think if it's uh, if it's blue, it means it's been added. Sorry, uh, and this is what I was saying about version one point one back at the very start that questions like this when you when you when you're in isolation and you're writing the rules you don't necessarily think of all of the edge cases and you know one of the criticisms i've had over the years about the rules and um, has been they're quite elitist they're aimed really at international players bc one two three four and possibly five and you know we as a governing body uh, uh, and as coaches and as athletes here, we're, we're playing at all sorts of levels. And I think that um, the rules, when you start to apply them in a more local setting or an example that you're just given there, Viv, um, yeah, that wouldn't have been on, on people's minds because you know that's just not going to happen at an elite level. So I think this is where, as we go through this version 1.2, will come out it's not that there's a brand new rules version 1.2 is correct it's more that these questions get raised they get put forward to the committee and they kind of go ah yes let's add that clarification to it or an interpretation by a head referee becomes commonplace and we then put it into into the rules so i think that's a really good question and as you can see i mean between pam and i we've probably got 30 years worth of international refereeing between us and we couldn't give you a straight answer straight away could we so that's where that interpretation comes in and that's why you know we're on version 1.1 and there will be a version 1.2 which may or may not answer your question more fully than we just have okay Rich, Last one. Um, oh, yeah. sorry could we just jump back to Two slides, actually, yeah, to the female coach one. Just want to clarify on that because it came up in the chat. Um, yeah, just to confirm, the the female female only playing division is not currently in place domestically, and we will continue to play mix. But the um, allowance for ind individual players to have a coach or a coaching assistant is currently active domestically so just to split those two things and confirm which what and how um i hate that makes sense yeah, yeah thanks for that just um, on that point um i was in logs just before christmas um and i actually spoke to claire morrison about that specific rule 
about the coach being able to come on court with individuals. And Claire said, at the moment, GB are not doing it. However, having said that, Sandra King and myself, we both, in fact, we had a play, uh, Sandra and I had players playing against each other. Uh, and we both agreed that we would try it uh, for that particular match. It was actually Penny Frude and Caroline Robinson. Um, and we both came on court. Uh, and I think both players agreed after the match had finished and, and all the, the dust had settled, they both agreed that, that you know, it was a help to them. So I've actually been involved in that. Um, and as a coach, it's something that I, I welcome because... You know, the the BC ones have a sports assistant with them, which often is a coach. The BC threes have a ramp assistant, which could also potentially be a coach. So they were potentially getting feedback between ends, whereas the BC ones and fours weren't. And I always felt that was slightly out of tilt. I won't say it was unfair. Um, so as a coach, I welcome that rule wholeheartedly yeah yeah and I think with all of this it's just being confident on any of the rules if you're unsure what's exactly in place at the competition you're you're attending and always just check with the home country the organizer um because there, there may also be differences between Wales Scotland Northern Ireland and England so yeah always clarify if there are any further adaptations we know we we make further tweaks at things like Heathcote Cup in England so um you know regardless of these brand new set of rules there still might be adaptations like that as we go through yeah and the last one the last slide um <clears throat> is around smart watches and phones and this isn't this isn't new uh, as such but it's just something that just becoming a lot more focused especially on smart watches um you know lots of people will have a an apple watch or a garmin or and they'll listen to their music and things it's just making sure that it is on on airplane mode we generally do that in the call room but you can check that whilst you're out on the court and um, because of in theory they could be receiving coaching advice um, mid-end and you know it'd be very difficult for us to be able to to see that so that's just an extra check that we have to do um just to make sure that in the call room that that they haven't got a smart watch or that it is on on airplane mode um as they as they are on court so not new as such but i think it's just been beefed up that rule i would say um uh in the in the new versions of the of the rules and I think, what's that? 827. Look at that. I've given you three, oh, 820. I've given you two minutes back um, of your of your evening. Um, look, these are this is a new rules update. There's always going to be new interpretations or things that'll that will come out as we go. We will always endeavor to keep you up to date as we as we go through. Um, but please you know, reflect on this, come back to Natsi with any questions and I'm sure we'll try and get the right answers to you. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes. Um, if there's any particular rules on that you want to ask, there might be a little bit more on a personal level. So please feel free to stick around there. But from me, thank you so much for taking part in this evening. I hope it was useful. I hope it was helpful. And uh, well, I'll hopefully see you in February at the first competition of the year if uh, if you're there or certainly later in the season so have a good evening and thank you for coming tonight thank you very much richard and thanks everyone for joining us um i'll follow up after this uh, with a little feedback survey and also we will get as i said we'll get this recording up on youtube if you do want to to watch it back to refresh yourselves further um but yeah stick around if you've got any more questions and like richard said hopefully see you at a competition very soon Actually, can I just ask, um, I know in COVID, everyone's got to leave the box when they move back, but without the COVID restrictions, they just move to the back of the box or they move out of the box. No, that's right. Yeah. So at the minute it's out of the box for the COVID adaptations, but the uh, assuming expect if, the, if those, that rule wasn't in place, then the BizFed rule would just be the out of the way one that we talked about tonight. And that would just, just be which is back, back of the box, of yes. but stay in the box. 
Yes. Right. OK, that's fine. <laughs> Thanks for that. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. I've just Bye. seen Jan's message about substitutes at, at league as well. Mm. Yes, Jan, we will allow subs in in our leagues. Um, but again, always check with your home country organiser as to exactly what that rule might apply if you're if you're not talking about a Botter England league, I would say. Thank you very much, everybody.